I'll keep plugging away I'll keep plugging away Am I saving the world? Not using flash Hi, my name is Gideon. I'm from Zero Zero DIY and this is the episode five of How Do You Brew? And today I'm joined by the wonderful Tom Hill. How you doing, man? Hey, man. Uh, I'm real good, thanks. Yeah. Um, just been out for a nice lockdown stroll in the freezing cold of February and uh, glad to be back indoors, to be honest. It's are you, are you, are you living in, in London? Is that right? I've just moved in with my girlfriend, actually, in Peckham. Um, oh, congratulations. I was living in... Thank you very much. Yeah, it's very nice. This is our humble abode. Got a record player set up and, you know, got lots good of books. Stuff. What more could you want? Um, yeah, I'm very well. Um, living in London in lockdown is strange because all the reasons that you normally attribute to it being worth paying extortionate rent have sort of vanished and you're just left with the the busyness of... Uh, the high street with none of the benefit but yeah um can't really leave london because i've got the studio so there yeah. you go wow where, um, where are you living at the minute so i'm i'm in i'm in mosey which is sort of on the other side of the thames from kingston i know it so, i know it yeah i i know it because of stakeout studios if you've aware of that studio on i think they're on the river aren't they is that the, mm-hmm. the place on the river and it's it um, it's uh the guy from pink floyd's studio i think is it yeah i think See, so I, I didn't know that. So the the chap who runs it is called Jason and he actually recorded a lot of uh, um, UK rock stuff from a while ago. Like a band called Ruben is probably... Yeah. So he recorded like race cars, race car backwards and stuff. He's yeah. quite a friendly chap. He's got a nice, very nice studio there and he's got a couple of cats, which are great. And um, yeah, so I've did a lot of recording at that studio um, yeah. before I had a permanent place to call my own so yeah which is now the bookhouse studio which is a phenomenally beautiful studio <laughs> thanks um, yeah it's, it's very very lucky to go and um, spend a day just watching you work about was it september last 2019 uh, so time is elastic and non-existent at the moment i don't know when that was it was could have been last week it's, it makes little difference during this current existence yeah all right man well tell me a bit about um hot beverages i'm i'm i was gonna say coffee but i feel like are you a coffee person or are you actually a tea person so um i began drinking coffee in my my last year of uni uh i got to let's say a fortnight before all my deadlines and had not done any work don't I hope my parents don't watch this because they'll be concerned but I basically had done absolutely nothing and was like people drink energy drinks to stay energized and they drink coffee and I don't like energy drinks so I'm going to give this coffee stuff a whirl so I bought some instant coffee and uh that is how it began and I can't drink instant coffee now because it is trash trash um but uh yeah I drink coffee every day usually two or three cups a day um sometimes strong sometimes not too strong uh usually good i don't really like i said can't drink instant coffee how how into the price like do you grind your own beans do you like what can tell talk me through a typical tom hill makes coffee so it's an odd one because yes so at the studio we've got a coffee grinder so generally have fresh beans get them get them ground up there um but i'm not doing anything fancy with the brew purely because it's very time consuming and if i'm making lots of pots of coffee for people throughout throughout the day um during a session i i just want it to be really quick i want to nip out there stick the kettle on like do anything else i need to do uh and just walk back in with a big old cafetiere full so I just chuck loads of grounds in there. No yeah. scales, I'm afraid. I can't okay. get technical about grams. I can't get technical. <laughs> I do. I do wait for the uh, kettle to like tick off. Okay. Um, not that I'm convinced it makes much difference, but um. Well, I was yeah. talking about this with um with waterfalls last in my first uh, episode because I was always told that you shouldn't boil the water for coffee because you might like burn it. Burn. Mm-hmm. But. He was saying that he watched the guy on YouTube whose name escapes me, but he's like the the coffee guy on YouTube, and um, he was saying that like 
because of the roasting process, you can't really like burn coffee because it's kind of it's already like been there. Yeah. So I've got like a pour over kettle, especially with a thermometer in it, so I don't boil the water. But now I'm told it doesn't make any difference. So Mm -hmm. (sighs) money, money down the drain potentially. Well, I'm not sure. I every now and then I'll have a coffee where I'm like this. Like from a, you know, cafe or whatever. When I'm like, oh, this tastes burnt or this tastes not right. Yeah. But I'm never sure what to attribute that to. Yeah. So perhaps it's not the temperature of the water after all. Who can say? Um, but no, I don't I don't get technical about the temperature. I, my estimates are through experience of just putting however much I feel is appropriate in rather than weighing. Um, I should say, so I share the Bookhouse Studio with uh, my friend Ian. He is much more into um, getting his scales out. Um, They look like drug dealer scales because they're like to the point whatever of the gram. And uh, yeah, using the exact right amount. And he'll make a pour over and get the nice circular motion going. Um, I just can't be bothered. If I'm going to have to do that all all through the day, I just want it to be, you know instantaneous but without needing instant coffee yeah fair enough do you, do you buy do you buy coffee from anywhere specific like if, do you just buy a supermarket coffee or do you do you get it from like uh, or? this this is a good chance for me to give uh my friend gilly a shout out so i've got um a good friend gilly who i met through playing in bands i met him at a gig in i think it was in i think it was in manchester somewhere in the north of england Uh, a couple of years ago and he we instantly just got on really well and he was saying that he wanted to get into studio stuff so he came and assisted me at the studio I used to work at a few times and he's just been working in coffee for a a long time so he for a while worked at uh, Old Spike which actually is based um, just in Peckham just down the road from where I live now and he then moved around a little bit he's now working at a place called Flying Horse um, and they have some really really tasty roasts if you like go on their website like the the, just the single origin um just go for the most expensive option they've got and it's just so good um yeah just whatever they've got going is what i get usually Um, does he approve of your kind of like non non non-measured kind of just make it quickly approach to coffee he, he does i think he's fine with people just doing kind of whatever they've got i think he had like a hand grinder um that he was using for a while and then he eventually bought like a proper expensive grinder for his home um i've just always had access to the little grinder that we've got at the studio it's it's fairly inexpensive one i think it was like 60 or 70 quid and um ian modded it following some youtube instruction to get the the grounds finer okay Um, so if you're making um like a proper shot um then you can but um going for a fairly coarse grind if when i'm doing cafetier stuff anyway so it's not the the largest difference but um yeah though those beans freshly ground are fantastic are just so good and gilly gilly used to work at um tap coffee as well and every time i would go in there which is on wardour street just slap bang middle of london right. and uh every time i go in there they have you know like a filter coffee or a espresso but they would have like a fairly extortionate like four pound fifty or five pound like pour over thing uh and if you ever go for that it's just like mind-blowing yeah um yeah i have a a few friends who are i i suppose coffee skeptics or just don't care i just did a i just did an album with a band called cassells um and they were just like i don't care what it is it just needs to be strong let's get it on the go uh <laughs> And I was like, cool, fine, absolutely fine. But they were like, you, rather, we basically ran out of sugar at the studio. So they were just pouring honey in it. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not good. But, you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, what you know, whatever, choose your, choose your stimulant, I suppose. Sugar, yeah. caffeine, both. Yeah, you know, lots of honey, say, yeah. Yeah, who can say? It's all, all just uh, makes the coffee. Um. Yeah. That's cool. And you, are you just making pots? You don't have like a specific kind of like, like so, ritual, or is it just? It's just uh, the book house, as you 
no, but people watching might not. Um, most studios are, you have a separate control room, a separate live room. Um, at the book house, it's all just in one room. So we're kind of like very easy to communicate. Everything's very immediate. If you want to use something, you just walk up to it and it's kind of ready to go. And that's, we try and keep it fairly accessible and fast paced. From my perspective though, um, it does mean that you're, it's quite fast paced working most of the yeah. time. And uh, if I want to get a break, then I will just go and make some coffee. So I quite like just having a few minutes by myself, um, away from everyone, everything, um, just to kind of get through in my head about what we've got to do next and what's sort of coming up and just stand in the freezing cold kitchenette of the studio uh, and just crack on. Um, There's no... Yeah, it's not... uh, it's 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 a ritual in that it's the way that it happens out of uh, coincidence and ease rather than that I've got this preconceived like I have to do it this way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just the way it happens. It's yeah. kind of it, really. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to have a slightly more interesting answer, but that's kind of it. And the the only difference is that when I'm at home, uh, I've just got like a glass jar that I'll just put. I'll grind some beans at the studio and just bring them home. And I'm at the studio every other day. So, uh, yeah, I never normally have to wait for too long. Um, The one exception is at the moment that I've actually got a huge bag of uh, flying horse grounds that my friend Gilly gave me. They, for some reason they couldn't sell them. So I've got this huge bag of grounds um, that are, that felt good for a week or so. uh, But at the, at the moment, like I need to get some, I need to get some more beans, yeah. man. Yeah, that's the problem with ground ground coffee. I think you just have to drink it so quickly. So yeah, yeah I'm I'm, yeah. I'm beans. And I've got a hand grinder and just just do that. Keeps it fresh. Mm. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, the person the person, if you um wind up working your way through uh, a list of studio engineers to interview about coffee, and I I, I fear you might even potentially get shown up, such as this man's uh, coffee nerdery. Um, is a chap called Al Lawson. So he used to be the engineer at Core, which is in Acton. Is it Acton? It's in West London somewhere. West London. That's, <laughs> that's where Ian did his uh, internship and worked there as an assistant for a while. He, Al, uh, is, you know, next level about absolutely everything. Just like the coarseness of the grind, the the weight, the just every single minute detail he uh loves getting cool. into that stuff well and al if, put, if you're watching reach out let's let's have you on the pod yeah i'm i'm fairly sure he would be up for it he's nice. a big big nerd <laughs> bro um let's let's talk about music um because you you're a studio engineer as you said but you've also played in loads of loads of bands over the years i'm sure um, i actually bands. met you um at the start in in guildford in probably 2014 when you were playing as uh, in glass mazes yep um, that would have been the one yeah and um i just remember you have this song called i swallowed the sun and i was like what does it mean and you were like well it means and you explained it to me and i was like cool i still don't really understand but that's great um yeah but, um, yeah so and you, you you just are you you just put some you just put some music out or you're about to put some music out with um, the muttering. Uh, yes. So three. yeah. Go on. Go yeah, on sorry. Failure by design. <laughs> yeah. No. Sorry. Um, so yeah, the, the, this new band is called Muttering, and uh, so the the most active band that I play in is called Modern Rituals, who are quite a uh, uh, often heavy, uh, often dissonant angular but sometimes quite nice band um band that uh your granny will not enjoy um and actually probably your parents and most of your family (laughs) won't either but some people really enjoy it which is nice and i've got a lot of work through the modern rituals album that i produced last year the year before losing track again time doesn't really exist anymore um and when needing to name this new band, I was just looking through album titles and song titles that I had in my iTunes because I just always think it's funny when you get a band that is named after a song or an album. Yeah, it yeah. Kind of 
novel. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, there's a modern ritual song from the record before I joined the band called right. Muttering. Uh, and it was just really apt and really fitting for like, the vibe of the music. And we, we were, our singer of Muttering, Chaz, was trying to think of a, a single syllable like gulp or like uh, blurp, just like lots of stupid things. And I was yeah. like, I get what you're going for with the simple, but I hate all of these ideas. Um, and muttering was a great idea but yeah uh muttering is the new band and we have one song out so far which is called swim um and it's through my friend ben so the gigs that i met you at at the star inn in guildford would have been put on by ben pollard yeah um and yeah so ben and uh, his friend connor yeah have had this label failure by design for a long time now yeah and he's almost wound it down to the point of not quite existing but mm. Um, they put out a record by uh, my friend's band Snake Eyes last year. Yeah. And they're still continuing to work with a really cool rock band called Weather State. But basically, yeah. I just sort of said to Ben, like, please, please help me with this release because I love being in a band and I love playing music, but I haven't got the clue. I haven't got like a clue what, what all the associated things you have to do to release music these days. I just, yeah. it's been a few years since I've had any involvement in it other than just showing up and playing guitar. So he's been a complete legend in just sorting everything out for us. He's just so good. But yeah, yeah, new band is very fun. A lot more accessible. Your nan might like it. Okay. Uh, it's got singing. Singing. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Rather than shouting. Yeah. That's great. It's yeah. Good I, stuff. I'm a big fan of um, FPD and uh, yeah, my, my memories on Facebook the other day was like, I think I was the first person to order something when, from their web store when it first went live. Nice. So, and I, I remember Ben put a thing in the thing. Shout Ben if you're watching. Come on the pod, man. Anyway, I'll stop trying yeah. to get people to come on the podcast. <laughs> um, I I I pre- prepared to prepared some questions, which I try and do for everybody, and uh, just for consistency, really, so just get everyone saying the same things. Um, cool. So my first question, which I think you have, or I told you I was going to ask you, um, can you tell me about a record that has? Uh, changed your life or impacted you in a significant way and you can have more than one if you were struggling to pick pick one got you so So i actually did not struggle to pick one and i picked one very easily and it will come as no surprise to anyone that knows me and it's probably a very basic answer um but when i was 16 i started a band at college with a couple of friends and that was still when myspace existed just to put in perspective how old and decrepit i am uh but um I was just adding bands on MySpace and I just found this band and all of their song titles were just animal names. And I was like, this is mental. What is this? And uh, forgot about them, completely forgot about them for like a week or two. And then was just like being like, oh, so did we find any good bands when we were just randomly adding stuff? Let's like have a look back through your list. And I was like, oh, I remember this band. They were the one with all the animals. And we like listened to them and uh, ended up being like, this is like incredible. Uh, it was a band called This Town, These Guns. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I immediately bought the CD of their album Animals and listened to it every day for over a year. I was listening to it multiple times a day. And uh, yeah, I it introduced me to the record label Big Scary Monsters. Through This Town These Guns, I found, this town, these guns, I found out about loads of bands like Colour, uh, Blackfish, Meet Me in St. Louis, um, Colour eventually sort of, trans morphed into tangled hair and i yeah. listened to them loads during my first year of uni uh they were from around kingston so they played there all the time so yeah. i was just i went to all of their shows uh i had a slightly weird awkward mcdonald's with them once where they just recognized me from gigs <laughs> and i was behind them in the queue for mcdonald's and they were like hey it's you Do you want to sit with us and i was just like okay uh yeah very odd but like yeah, Animals by This Town These Guns, man. I had only ever played guitar with a pickup till then as well. And uh, any experience of like finger picking stuff I'd ever seen was like folk music that I just found incredibly dull. Like yeah. now I'd probably appreciate it and enjoy it, but back then I was like, ugh, what is that? Yeah. And uh, yeah, like the guitarist of This Town These Guns, TTNG, uh, Tim Collis. Uh, just like is a wizard like his fingers move at the speed of light and he's all over the place and tapping and all this stuff and like 
yeah, at the time it was completely new to me and I was just blown away by it. And like, yeah, I was fully obsessed with that. I've even got a TTNG tattoo now. And yeah, Where is it? Fully, Let's see it. Come on. Uh, I'm not. It's not a good <laughs> one to get out because it's on, on my ribs and I've been oh. eating a lot of pizza recently, but it's right here. And it's just uh, it's just an an island. Yeah, they've got an album called Disappointment Island, so yeah. I've got a tattoo of the outline of Disappointment Island on my ribs. Wow. Uh, anyway, yeah, fully just like didn't go back to listening to the Kooks, did I? Just uh, <laughs> cracked right on with UK underground indie music. Yeah. And then hardcore, which I found through Associated Record labels, and got well into that. And yeah. Met yeah. most people I know through music and I probably wouldn't have gone down the musical routes I have gone down if I hadn't have found that record. So yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's good. I love it. I love a good origin story. And yeah, that's that's totally I think um Trev who was on episode two also talked about Tangled Hair and T T N G. So I think just across across the board they're just really well kind of recognised important bands for that this scene, aren't they? So Yeah, hundred percent. Um, so have you, have you got a gig then that um, kind of impacted you in a similar way, like either one you played or one that you went to? So I was having a think about this and because when you sent over a list of questions, which was incredibly helpful and the way that it was phrased was just, I think it was like a gig that changed my life is yeah. the way you'd phrased it. And yeah. I was trying to think about this and I can't think of any gigs where... I went to a gig and came out of the gig a different person. But uh, <laughs> continuing the predictable nature of my favourite record, uh, the the one sort of gig weekend I remember as just being like, uh, just the whole time being like, this is incredible. Um, this is just like so much that I love and I am so glad that I've chosen to leave uni refuse to get a real job and persist in being broke to pursue doing music for a career because it's just so good was uh just arctangent and i think i actually can't remember the year i want to say 2017 might have been 2018 can't remember who knows uh but american football played just I think it was after 2017 that. i think good. It was 2017, i'm glad yeah. i'm glad i'm right uh yeah american football had just done their like uh, I guess we're a band again. Comeback tour. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit strange and like just spiralled out of control and ended in them doing a lot more, which I'm very glad about, to be honest. But this time these guns played and their original singer, Stu, came and joined them on stage for a couple of songs. Uh, Meet Me in St. Louis, who were one of my just all-time favourite bands. I'm like, it's slightly cringeworthy, actually, because I used to be such a big fan of... Uh, their singer Toby Hayes project Shoes and Socks Off that he did that happened after me in St. Louis. Right. And uh, yeah, he's like friends with one of the guys in Modern Rituals, which I've, you know, joined Modern Rituals. They're all a little bit older than me. I'm 28 and they're all like th- just over 30. Right. And uh, yeah, so they, they just knew each other from gigs and band stuff from like back in the day or whatever. And uh yeah, Toby has come to a few of our gigs as Modern Rituals, and I'm just like, this is like one of my music. I don't want to say music heroes because that's very <laughs> cringe I don't like putting anyone on a pedestal because I like, calm down, mate. But uh, spent a lot of time listening to his music, and then him yeah. to be like interested in a band that I'm in is just mental. Uh, I really hope he doesn't see us or no one tells him this because that's <laughs> even worse. <laughs> I don't want that. Anyway, point being, Arc Tangent. That weekend, I just was spent the whole weekend being like, this is, I'm glad I do music because yeah, all oh, this is so good. Uh, specifically remember getting a cheeky like glaze over my eyes, being like, I'm not going to cry when uh, American football were playing. I probably had a lot to drink, but there you go. Did you, um, did we got a mutual friend, Jack, and I, I keep seeing his photos from either atg or trees but like the beer can uh the beer can star uh, did you have one of those yeah the uh, what do you call it candalf uh 
all the, wiz- all the wizard's <laughs> staff thing. Yeah, there's like rules that go along with it normally, I think, but we just didn't really do that. Like I think every, basically every time you finish a can of beer, you sellotape the empty can to the bottom of your new can of beer. So you're drinking from the top one and below is like a staff of empty cans. Uh, and it just basically looks like you, makes you look like an obnoxious little oik. And uh, I feel quite cringeworthy. It's quite cringeworthy <laughs> that we did that. But at the same time, I don't really care. Not really bothered. But we accidentally said, yeah, sure. We'll have our picture taken to like the official ATG photographer. And he, like, n- not he, it wasn't him directly but someone decided that the photo of me jack and marcus was the perfect marketing marketing ploy to get people to come to atg for future years so on all of the facebook ads was just a picture of me jack and marcus just like (laughs) drinking fosters from a spear like a staff uh and i just got endless messages because everyone that i know to you music gets like ads for ATG on their Facebook. People just being like, is this you being really obnoxious drinking beer from a staff? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. yeah. Oh. What a cool moment, man. What a cool moment. It was very funny. All right. So on the flip side, that was your best experience. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned American football because, you know, just because there's, they're, they're, someone's, someone's described them to me yesterday as the, like the chair of, of, uh, of emo and, uh, that kind of that kind of music it's just so it's yeah. just like it's just furniture isn't it it's just such a placeholder yeah and i think the i have gone to various uh lengths to explore the like tunnel system that is the weird kinsella projects of <laughs> you know like especially tim kinsella and things that he's involved with like, like joan of arc and yeah i i went to joan of arc in dalston with ian um, a year or two ago, I guess that they've they've ended that project now. So I guess that's probably right. their final UK tour. And I don't know her name, but the the lady who plays in that band now uh, plays with a fake guitar made of cardboard, <laughs> and it's just got a contact mic built into it. So for the most of the set, she stands pretending to play guitar like on a piece of cardboard she's got tied around her neck with a shoelace. And every now and then just picks it up and like shouts into this piece of cardboard and it, because the contact mic going through an amp or something, or it's going through like the other guy's looping station that he's got, it just makes crazy sounds sort of come out. It's absolutely bonkers. But uh, yeah, there's that. And you know, the older Joan of Arc albums just sound like twinkly emo. Uh, But yeah, like owls and um, captain jazz and stuff like that. Like, it's all it's not all great some of it's awful and i hate it but uh a lot of it's really cool but you're exactly right american football absolute staple of emo and math rock yeah. and all that yeah yeah totally. big big winner so um we talked about your best gig and i went on a tangent talking about american football there but um have you got a worst gig that comes to mind again something you played or something you went to I do you believe un- in worse gigs as a concept? Well, I would love to say no, but yes, absolutely. I, I'm a <laughs> frustratingly positive person most of the time. I think I can be quite unbearable in just not really understanding what the big deal is when people are like complaining to me about stuff. I think I'm quite like ignorant and when people are like, oh, this happened and like I'm not very good at being sympathetic. I'm just like, so, like, move on. <laughs> don't, really, don't really see the issue here. Uh, and I think part of that in music is me just forgetting all the things that went really badly. Um, The worst gig that I can think of is one that I played with Glass Mazes. And this may or may not have been the one that I met you at. I don't remember specifically which uh, it was that I met you at, to be honest. But we, as Glass Mazes, played an acoustic set once at the Star in Guildford. And it was just me and Ed. I sat down on a stool and he stood next to me. And it looked stupid and it sounded awful because, like I said, I'm a terrible singer. Uh, So I was just playing and sort of like still kind of shouting into the mic like I do when it's like a full band thing, but just playing acoustically. And Ed's actually got a little bit of a... Oh, no, he's got a very good singing voice. And he was... uh, It was so bad, man. It was so bad. I should have just... uh, When we got offered the gig and found out that our uh, drummer, Kurt, couldn't do it, I should have been like, we can't do the show. 
But I was just like being positive as I am was just like, yeah, we'll do it. We'll fix up. Yeah, it'll be great. It'll be cool. Everyone's going to love it. And it was the worst thing I've done <laughs> to the extent that uh, Andy Halloway, who was the singer of Yearbook, and I'm still mates with people from that band, and I still speak to him very occasionally, uh, like slated us on stage when they oh. played. And I was just stood there being like, oh, I just want to go home. This is so bad. This is so bad. It was just awful. Worst thing I've ever done in my life. Like, I think I think that was the gig that I met you at. But I don't. I think if I thought it was really terrible, I probably wouldn't have spoken to you. So I think I think like I thought it was probably all right. So yeah. Oh well, that's good to know. I don't. And okay. also, I spoke to Ben after the set because obviously he put the show on. And yeah, he was yeah. Like, that was cool. It was like is what it was. And I was like, yeah, yeah, cool, fine. But uh, in my head, when I was that's the only time I've ever been on stage. And I've like thought, I need to get off the stage. Like I hate this. It was just awful. Never want to go through that again. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that was a traumatic experience. I think I think that was the show, and I think I enjoyed it because I you said yearbook, and I I reckon it, the yearbook were probably either the headline or the band straight after you. Got yeah. Um, yeah. So. I, I I should say I did know you play in Modern Ritual. I just forgot to bring it up. So I'm, I'm I I was aware. I I that's, felt bad as soon as you said it. I was like, oh no, I forgot. Like no, Modern no, Rituals, that's and that's cool. like Modern Rituals. I've joined. I've been in the band for a while now, two or three years. I've lost track. Uh, time doesn't exist. Uh, <laughs> I've lost track of how long I've been in that band, and uh, it's very much Harry's band. The singer Harry Fanshawe, he's just like a machine at writing songs. Like we're we're in the process of recording our third album, and he is like halfway through writing the fourth album already. Like okay. he's he's churning it out, and like I've tried to write a song to present to Modern Rituals, and it's just not sounded like a Modern Rituals song. So like I am in that band, and I love being in that band, and love playing guitar in that band, and like usually like touring with that band but like uh i don't consider it my band as band that i'm in but i don't consider it my band if sure. that makes sense in the sure. same way that i have been writing most of the music for muttering so i consider yeah. that more well mine. what is tell me about the like the inspiration for muttering then kind of what what you've been what you because are you are you going to play something from muttering in, yeah so are you gonna do like a playthrough or something i think yeah i i as I mentioned, I'm a terrible singer. I can get away with doing some backing vocals or if I'm shouting, it's kind of fine. And most of the stuff that I've done where I'm a vocalist in a band is very yelpy. And uh, yeah, but in an acoustic playing from home set, it doesn't really come across very well. So um, rather than sit here and, you know, damage people's eardrums, I thought I would just do a bit of a playthrough of a muttering song of this new song, Swim, and just like, just chat about what I was trying to achieve with guitar parts for this band um and uh what i was trying to achieve for the songwriting and stuff like that and then to show how i made that sort of happen in this one particular song Great. um there's a couple of other bits i might play from other songs off the ep but that's slightly cheeky because though the ep has been announced none of the other music is out yet so a bit of a sneak preview potentially sneak preview. Yeah. if anyone cares to hear one riff from a song they're not going to hear the whole thing off but uh yeah it's probably well enough in tune for the purpose of this um so basically with this new band muttering what i wanted to do was do an rem uh what's his face oh, what is his face peter park is that peter park i lose i lose track guy from rem guitars from rem always picking his right hand always very busy Left hand, kind of doing some chord shapes, doing some bits and bobs, but right hand always busy doing some arpeggios. And it's too easy just to strum. It's boring. Um, I do it all the time in modern rituals. I do it all the time in every other band I've done. So I just wanted to be constantly arpeggiating stuff. And uh, yeah, so it's just based around like a moving, basically, you know the Bonnevere self-titled record? Um what's that called well it's called Bonavera, isn't it the opening chord goes like this and the song goes on from there uh, I wanted to write something around that because if you just move that and like you've got the open strings ringing like the open D string ringing through our...
I just wanted to write something that was very, very simple with the left hand, barely doing anything, really putting in very minimal effort with the left hand. This finger comes on and off, but that's about it. Uh, I've always just the right hand just like cracking away. It's fairly fast, fairly nippy. But the uh, majority of the song, that's like the chorus main tag riff bit. Um, other than that, there is some strumming. I sort of wussed out of cracking through the whole song with just picking. But uh, that's the most of it. Um, I'll just play you that riff. <laughs> that's like the main riff and that's kind of what I was trying to achieve there is just busy right hand easy going left hand um, fingers crossed when we can play a show I can rock out a little bit while I play all these parts so they look really complicated but actually they're very easy and uh, everyone thinks I'm the best <laughs> just kidding but um, yeah that's kind of what I was going for with that um, rest of the song sort of again like very easy I just wanted to create a very like laid back vibe where it feels uh, there's momentum, there's pace, everything's developing, but it's not like showy, it's not too busy, it's not too, it's not too anything. It's kind of laid back and creates this like nice vibe, inspired by, largely by some pianos become the teeth stuff where it's all very chilled, but uh, I don't know, it's got some pace to it, but it's, it doesn't feel aggressive or busy or whatever. Um, the next bit's like dead easy, it's just... Um, that's kind of just like my obsession with semitone clashes. Um, and making making do with open strings, just like if you can um, create a part of fretting essentially like nothing. Uh, just getting some cool parts in. Um, yeah, I don't know. And uh, the chorus is just uh so the chorus weirdly only comes around a couple of times and isn't really a chorus it's just like a part that leads into the main riff the part i've already shown you um but again just being really economical of parts this is inspired by the fact that modern ritual songs typically have a lot of different bits there there's a lot to remember and i think for this i just wanted to write really 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 simple songs um so it's just some strumming it's just <laughs> Again, being economical of songwriting and economical of guitar parts, economical of playing, uh, the bridge is as simple as this. It's just an octave jump. And then back into a chorus. Um, and just some some of the stuff is like a bit gross but intentional just where you're like fretting the F sharp or F because I'm down tuned and it's clashing with the open G string just because then it sounds nice when it resolves um, that's kind of it basically just a plug to go and listen to our new single Swim really um, just trying to be economical but I was just going to really quickly whiz through a couple of other bits from other songs um, again with just like the thing I've been concentrating in these songs is the, the semitone uh, clash or whatever. Um, so there's a song on the EP uh, which is going to be out in April, I would say a date, but I don't know it, can't remember, sorry, uh, where it's just this. <laughs> Again, continuing the theme of like 
remaining economical with songwriting whilst keeping it interesting. Uh, the second verse just changes vibe, just changes uh, the groove. Um, and rather than being straight and slow, it just goes into like a triplety thing. So it's just... <laughs> Just with the, but really getting that like so close that it's kind of gross, but kind of really nice as well. One other song in the EP got exactly the same thing. The whole first riff of one of the songs is just a semitone bend from. It's just. Does that over and over again. Chaz is singing a really pretty little hook. He's a very, very good melody writer. And uh, that song is, if I do say so myself, very good. Uh, purely because he has written something really beautiful. Over what is quite an ugly thing. But the whole point of this riff is that it resolves to a B major 7 type thing. Which then has like the semitone clash becomes apparent again as a really ganky, horrible way when you suddenly hit the E on the bass. Um, just being economical again with songwriting where you just making the most of that throughout the whole song. Like. Yeah, that's it. I just wanted to show off all these parts because I'm well happy with them and a uh, bit of a plug for swim, you know. Yeah, and I can't sing. So there you go, that's kind of that. Well, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much for that. It's love. It's always great to get a little bit of an insight, and maybe I'll study your video and try and learn your song. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not hard to learn. I think you'd manage it very quickly and easily, to be honest. Just trying to be smart about writing stuff that might look or sound complicated and serves a purpose, but is actually very simple, and means I don't have to practice too much. I'll put this down because otherwise I won't stop playing it. Nice. Well, Tom, thank you so much for, for being here and, and being part of the podcast. And um, No problem. Uh, yeah, this, is, this has been episode five. Uh, thanks so much, Tom, and we'll see you guys another time.